Well, welcome everybody. I'm gonna let people file in today. We're excited. Uh, if you're ready to hear from a CISO, uh, sales loft CISO, Mike Meyer, you're, you are in the right place. This is the correct webinar. So thank y'all for joining. I know people are kind of joining a minute or so late. So I'll uh, ramble here for a second as, as everyone joins in. But uh, we really appreciate everybody joining. Uh, a very exciting uh, program today. Uh, I've known Mike for, I guess, 10 years now, which seems crazy. Uh, but about 10 years now, Mike and I started our careers both in consulting. We uh, worked together for a while. And uh, now Mike's been a client of ours uh, over at Sales Law for, I guess, about five or six years now. And Mike and I caught up ahead of this this call. And uh, he just has an incredible journey in terms of uh, Sales Law scale and growth, uh, in terms of reporting directly to the CEO, which is something that, that CISOs and security leaders uh, really want to hear. And just like very practical tools in terms of uh, how to scale a program, how to keep it efficient, but also uh, building a really good program at the same time. So Mike, we, we appreciate you being here. And if you wouldn't mind, could you just kind of start off by giving us the background of Sales Loft, who is Sales Loft and kind of the rundown of your career? Yeah, absolutely. And and super happy to be here, Christian. I think it's been more like seven years. So you, you guys have been a great partner for a long time. Nice. Um, you mentioned Sales Loft. Yeah, for context, for the rest of the discussion, I'll talk about Sales Loft quite a bit. So just so everybody knows, Sales Loft is a revenue orchestration platform. So you can think about that as sort of a system to coordinate the efforts across all of the go-to-market teams, right? Marketing, sales, customer success, so that those teams can, can act with a high degree of certainty. Um, and, and you can think about the, uh, the platform as sort of a performance force multiplier that ultimately the goal is for us to drive durable revenue for our customers. Um, so, so, so you've got the context. I'll give you kind of my, my career background. Uh, starting, uh, starting off, I, I started my career at, at Deloitte in the technology risk group. And so that was really my first foray into cybersecurity. I, I was actually a, a, an accounting major in college. So it makes sense that I ended up in an accounting firm. Uh, cybersecurity was a bit of a surprise for me when I got there, but it was a, uh, it was a, a field that I quickly dove into and fell in love with. Um, you know, from there, I went on to Shellman, where you and I worked together for a little bit. We overlapped there. Um, while I was at Shellman, I helped lead the SOC 2 practice. And so, uh, you know, I got a lot of exposure to uh, SaaS businesses who had this need to sort of represent their technology environment to their customers uh, in, a, in a legitimate and defensible way that kind of helped build trust. Um, and so, you know, uh, that was a one, a great exposure to, uh, to cybersecurity principles, but it was also good exposure to sort of how SaaS businesses operate and sort of what some of their, their problems and objectives are. Um, and then through that, uh, SalesLoft was actually a client of mine while I was at Shellman. So even as an auditor, I was able to, to really see the, the sort of vision for the company and, and uh, was excited about where they were going. And so when it was time for them to bring on somebody to manage the program full time, uh, that was when I joined. And so uh, I stepped away from the audit and consulting world really for the first time. Um, I, I sort of, I found myself wanting to see beyond kind of the the limited scope, uh, short-term engagements and really be part of like building something and uh, be excited about, you know, uh, uh, the the long-term, um, you know, kind of objectives of not only the business, but the the security program as well. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've been at sales Loft for seven plus years. It's been an incredible journey. Um, I get to, like you said, I get to serve on our executive leadership team now, which is, uh, truly a privilege. And yeah, that brings us to today. Mike, talk, talk to me. I know a lot of people were kind of in there, uh, a very common inflection point is going from being a consultant, like, you know, the standard big four consultant, mm -hmm. like most, a lot of us started our careers into, uh, an internal security role. And like mm -hmm. a lot of times people go into internal audit departments, they go into more GRC. Mm -hmm. You kind of went into like a managing the program leading into CISO role. Can you talk about that? Like what were some of the things you were considering transitioning out of consulting into, into a internal role? Uh, mm -hmm. What are some of the things you think that consulting prepared you really well for? What are some things that maybe were surprised that it didn't prepare you very well for? Yeah. Uh, I, things that things that surprised me, uh, it, that one feels a little bit easier because it was so different, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I think I was surprised by just how much you don't see when you're a consultant. When you're a consultant, like I said, you have kind of these limited scope engagements where you're focused on 
maybe you're you're doing a, a SOC two assessment and yeah. this is uh, you know one system, um, you know, but then you get in into the the actual uh, program and you start looking at risk for the business and it goes so far beyond just what's covered in a a SOC two report. Um, you know, I think those those frameworks are are designed to help to provide a framework, right? Uh, but they're not they don't equal compliance. I think that's a, a common axiom and so. Um, I think that was one of the things that surprised me. Um, but I, I will say, I think the consultant mentality, especially jumping into leading a program, when when you first join, if you're if you're starting a program from the ground up, and you know, to be to be completely fair to our team, we had a bunch of people who were doing security things, but we didn't have anybody doing security full time and thinking about risk full time. Yeah. When you when you come into that seat, uh, and you're the first person and you're building that program really from the ground up. I, I do think consulting prepares you well for that because you're sort of acting as a consultant to the business for for that first at least you know nine to twelve months. Yeah, I think it's super. Like my experience now being at Risk Three Hundred and Sixty for almost ten years, but still acting in consulting. I think consulting, like you said, gives you that builder mindset where you're mm-hmm. like thinking process, getting off the ground quickly, yeah. adding a lot of value. But yeah. there's something about being uh, having to live with the house you built. You know what I mean? As an internal mm-hmm. team member. Like all the mistakes you made, all the organizational change, all the relationships and maintaining a program is to me, at least totally different from building a program, but you've kind of done both. You built the program and you're now maintaining and continuously improving the program. Can you speak to that? Are there any like major differences or shifts in mindset from building versus maintaining? Oh man. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know if you want to get into kind of like the the journey of, of sales loft. But I mean, when we were a startup, right, you're, you're sort of, you're treading water in a lot of ways. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, we, like I said, we had some amazing control owners when I, when I joined the business, uh, but we were missing some of the like table stakes functions, right. Like having a, a well-defined set of policies um, you know, some of the things that our customers just wanted to see again, as like table stakes controls Um that were that ultimately ended up being really sort of foundational to kind of our long term success. But at the beginning, man, you are there was no roadmap. Uh, there was no we did we weren't ISO twenty seven thousand one uh, compliant. Uh, ISO twenty seven thousand one you know helps with sort of implementing sort of yeah. a framework, a, a management system around your program. Um, GDPR was not in effect yet, but it was coming, and so that was a catalyst for a lot of the things that we ended up doing. Um, so that's like early early on. Um, again, you're, you're sort of, you're treading water. You're trying to address customer needs as fast as you possibly can. Um, but you're, y- y- it feels like you're reactive in a lot of ways, uh, right yeah. at the beginning. And then, you know, as, as you get more mature, you're able to, uh, you know, start getting in front of things and be a little bit more proactive. Yeah. So for people who don't have that context, I think Mike, you joined, I think we talked about it. Like, I think sales life was sub, sub, sub 10 million, uh, when you first joined. Yeah. Uh, just and, Yeah. And you've seen them grow. 2,500% or 25 X over the course of, you know, less than 10 years, which is just yeah. an incredible journey. So anyone who's ever worked at a startup, like you were describing, mm-hmm. like that's a very different dynamic than a fully fledged, like emerging enterprise company with a lot of maturity, a lot of processes, right? As you right. kind of reflect on that journey, like what, what are some of the big inflection points from startup to, to enterprise that stand out to you? Yeah. So like I mentioned with that first, that first year or so, is one for me adjusting to a new role, right? Yeah. Getting to know the business, trying to understand what is this company, what is the the product that we we build, what is our value proposition to the market, um, and then what what really do we uh, from a risk perspective, what do we need to be thinking about long term? And then there's also an element, by the way, of hey, our customers have lots of questions. They're trusting us with data. How do we make sure that we are uh, building a um, sort of the scaffolding that you need to be able to uh, continue to earn that trust, but it's it's super fast. It's coming at you 100 miles an hour. You're saying yes to things then that maybe you wouldn't have said yes to now, like mm-hmm. filling RFP for a very small customer or something like that, right? Um, because you're 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 still in that stage of of finding product market fit, right? And so um, you're you're doing things that looking back may not seem natural, but at the time very were uh, very much were. Um, and so then I think you know as I think about like scaling, some of the inflection points I think about. Uh, one was uh, the establishment of a risk council or risk committee. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think an interesting thing for for CISOs who are just getting started is to think about the fact that very few executives will ever say no when somebody asks, "Should we talk more about cyber risk?" Right. 
Yep. Um, and so either you have an executive who wants to roll up their sleeves and uh, and understand the problems that security teams are facing that our customers think about when it comes to risk, or you've got an executive who might say, well, shoot, I don't want to be the one person that says, uh, you know, we shouldn't talk about cyber. And then we have a breach and it's, it, you know, everybody points the finger back at me. Um, and so in general, like people are going to want to talk about risk if you ask. And the cyber risk, you know, council has been a really good way for us to like surface those those primary issues that executives need to know about, identify the trends that we're seeing either externally in the industry or internally within our business. Um, if there are major like risk acceptances that we need to talk through at that level. Um, and then it's also just kind of an accountability mechanism for you as a leader, right? We've established this, maybe you've established a roadmap or you said, here's what we're going to do over the next six to 12 months. This is a way for you to report back to leadership to say, Hey, this is, you know, we're, we are, uh, achieving what we said we would achieve. Um, and then that helps build credibility long-term as well. Yeah, that's, uh, the risk council is like one of the early milestones we see with a lot of customers because it effectively creates the table that you can have a seat at, right? Because mm -hmm. otherwise all the conversations around cybersecurity are a little bit ad hoc, yep. uh, but this creates the place. Do you remember Do you remember who was on the IRC when you first joined it? Yeah, when we first stood it up, it was our head of operations, our president, our CTO, and then myself and another member of the security team. So it's very small. It's yeah. bigger than that today, but it's the same. We've done it continuously since 2018. We've we've had the same quarterly meeting uh, done every every single quarter since 2018. I mean, that's interesting that even early on, you know, you had ops, which is like Azure scaling is he mm -hmm. seeing all aspects of the business. You guys are a product company, so having the CTO right. at the table is kind of essential. So yeah, that's pretty good coverage early on. Yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. Cool. Oh, the other the other person that we quickly added, we didn't have uh, in house, you know, legal, but we we added counsel very quickly, and that's another important voice to have in those discussions. If you've got access to you know to to legal professionals, to attorneys, right? You want them in the room for those yeah. discussions. Too. Well, one of the things I see uh, on the information risk councils is like sometimes when they first start, there's like a lot of momentum because people are very interested. They're like, all right, "What is this all about? Cybersecurity is cool. It's interesting." Yeah. But then like three, four, five meetings in attendance drops, engagement goes down. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. that's, that's a challenge, but you've been doing it. I mean, you must be on your 40th or something now, if you're doing them quarterly, you know, so yeah, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. What are you doing yeah. to keep them interesting or how, how do you uh, keep engagement going? What, what are the meetings before the meetings look like to make sure you're bringing the right material? What's that world look like for you? Yeah. So we do, we actually do kind of, uh, we do the quarterly large risk council, right. But the process, if you look, uh, you know, beyond that, it's, it's a much, uh, there, there are, there's a different rhythm to it besides just quarterly, right? So yeah. on a monthly basis, we're also meeting with kind of uh, control owners at sort of like the director level uh, to make sure that we're surfacing and hopefully solving some of the more, I won't call them trivial, but maybe some of the more in the weeds kind of detailed issues. We, we get into the weeds in those meetings, right? And then the, the, the risk council is really ideally much more strategic and directional, Right, we want to be able to say, "Hey, our vulnerability management program is uh, succeeding, or we're we're seeing major challenges in this one area." Yeah. Right. What we don't want to get into is, "Hey, we've got this one open source dependency that's got you know uh, a number of C like you don't want to be getting into that level of detail." I think in the risk council, I think eyes will glaze over often, and and folks will lose interest. So we try to, like I said, keep it high level, keep it strategic, keep it digestible, especially for the folks that are non tech uh, stakeholders. Yeah, it's interesting you do that. Uh, we have. Uh, our co-founder Christian White, he's a West Point guy, so he was an Army officer, and our COO Tim, also Army officer guy. So one of these principles they brought into our consulting formula and Risk Three Hundred and Sixty itself is this idea of building uh, of meetings building on each other. So you have, maybe yeah. you have a weekly meeting that's very tactical, the monthly meeting is a little less tactical than the quarterly meeting is very strategic. Right. It sounds like you've intuitively done that. Yeah, that you're having yeah. monthly meetings that kind of build into the quarterly mm -hmm. meeting. And I think yeah. that's missing a lot. I see that missing a lot in organizations. Like you don't talk to anyone all quarter except for, you know, the control owners. Then yeah. you try to put together this strategic quarterly meeting. And it's this weird mix of in, way too in the weeds and right. way too high level. And and that doesn't work very well. Sounds like you got a good balance going though. Exactly. I think you, like you, you've got to have, uh, you know, consistency. You've got to have the... Uh, the topic that you're discussing and the the type of material that you bring to that discussion has to be sort of commensurate with the group that's there. And you can feel it when there's a mismatch, 
you can feel it when you're getting into the weeds on a technical topic with the CFO or the CEO, yeah. um, who, who genuinely may not, may not care to hear all the detail. Um, and so you can, you can sort of feel it and you can, you can see, you, you can see yourself lose the audience if you do that. Um, yeah. and, that's what, and by the way, you mentioned kind of meetings, building on meetings. One of the other things that we've always done at sales loft is standups. And, you know, when we were back in, back when we were in the office a little bit more often, right. You had, you know, daily standups where teams across the business at the, at the individual contributor level would be having meetings with their frontline manager, 10, 15 minute meetings to just say, here's what I'm focused on for the day. It's an opportunity to align on priorities, but also a chance to like, Hey, I, you know, say, Hey, I've got a blocker, um, you know, and I need your help to remove it. Uh, that blocker can get, can then get escalated when that manager goes to his standup yep. or her standup with their, their manager all the way up to the ELT standup that, that happened last, right? That was the last standup to occur. And in theory, there was, you know, this, this ability to, to have all of those stand up or all of those blockers rather removed. And then all of, all of the company was aligned. Right. Yeah. Uh, and it was just a, a really, and it, I say, I say was, because that was when we were in person and you could see it. We still do it today. It's just done uh, often uh, remotely over zoom. That's awesome. Yeah. I like that engineer you know, the, the agile development culture yeah. of build up, but applied yeah. to a full business, which you guys have done very well. Yeah. So you kind of, uh, just to recap, you kind of have the startup culture. And as you were scaling, you formed the Information Risk Council. Like, what are the, what are some of the other inflection points you guys have seen along the way? Yeah, I think about our funding rounds as sort of milestones, right? Just along the way. Yeah. Uh, I think back to like, I joined uh, right after Series B. Series C was really the first time that a couple different things happened. One, we were asked by our investors about our cyber strategy for the first yeah. time. They, they, for the first time, were asking like, hey, this is, you know, this is getting to a point where we should see uh, an improvement in the maturity of your program. Um, there are certain, you know, controls that they asked about the same way a customer would. Um, so that was really interesting. And it was a, a great experience for me to just see how that's done. And then also, um, it was also the first time that we made an intentional investment with that uh, raise, right? It was the first time we said, hey, explicitly we are going to use some of these dollars to go build out our program build out our team um which was great and it, it i kind of talked about uh being reactive being yep. able to make some of the investments we wanted to make and, and build up the team to where it was more than just me allowed us to get a little bit more proactive and start to really kind of uh, improve the maturity of the program as opposed to just kind of taking what what came to us yep so t tell me about um like this, this uh, latest round, like becoming a, a Vista equity portfolio company. I know we've talked before and there's kind of like a new level of maturity and expectations at the current scale you guys are at. What are some of the, the big changes you're seeing now? Yeah, I think, you know, one one other thing that I think I would call out pre-Vista was with a, a major inflection point, which is hiring a seasoned security. Uh, yeah. leader, right. So I would encourage people if you're in this spot and you, you have the ability to find leaders who can do things that you can't do, but also see the vision the same way you do and can help you execute it. Um, I, I think of like the CISO role as kind of a, a lonely position, right? You're not yeah. super aligned to product, IT kind of sales success. Like none of those teams are kind of thinking about the world the, the same way as you. And so, um, you know, just, just having another person to help you go execute that vision and the other, the other piece of it is that CISOs are just expected to be experts in a lot, right? There's compliance, uh, identity and access management. There's third-party risk, uh, AppSec, threat modeling, governance, right? There's all these things that CISOs are kind of expected to be experts on. Having that extra set of hands to help you build it um, is, is crucial. And, and obviously, you've got to find the right timing. You've got to have, it's got to make financial sense. Um, but, but that was a big inflection point for us to be able to, you know, continue on that, um, to kind of take the next jump on our, our maturity curve. Yeah. Building the team out. What, what were some, as you were thinking about, well, let me back up a little bit. Sometimes yeah. as an early security leader, there's like this careful balance between being a good fiduciary for the business, like trying to stay lean. You don't want to ask for too many heads because you know that product and there's other big needs for the business, but there does come a point where you need more people to mature the program. That's the bottom right. line. Right. So as you were thinking through, let's talk about your first hire and then like how you were thinking about structuring your team as it, as it grew, 
Mm-hmm. What what was the first hire you made? Was it the seasoned experienced person or was it something else? No, it was uh, I hired somebody to to essentially run security operations. Yeah. So, you know, hey, there's um uh, if there's an alert that that goes off in a system, we we need somebody looking at that alert that's not just me, right? Um if if we've got a uh, a vulnerability management a vulner- vulnerability scanning system, we need somebody kind of uh, doing the oversight of that system and working with the control owners to actually, you know, if it's a patch, right, apply the patch and make sure that it's planned. Um, so that was the first person I hired, and so that was that was important for me because again, as I said, like I didn't come from that background, so yeah. I brought in somebody who did. Uh, and she was great. She was able to to sort of help help get the um, get the program off the ground for the first time to where it was like I said I, we weren't as reactive as we were when it was when it was just one person. Yep, makes um, sense. So that was the first hire, and then I think the after that the way we've structured the program is essentially we've got operations, engineering, application security, and then GRC, um, which you can kind of you know by the by the names of those teams you can kind of uh, you know identify what they what they do. Uh, but those are the sort of umbrella departments within security that we have. Uh, did you, was it hard? I've, I've been in environments where uh, it is very hard for security leader to get additional staff. So there's like this process of putting a business case together, mm-hmm. takes a long time to get the hire. Mm-hmm. Uh, what What is it like for you? Is Are there like a any guidance that you would give folks who are trying to get new talent to get the yes from the executive team instead of roadblocks? Yeah, I use data where you can. Right. I think I also think uh, cyber maturity frameworks are your friend. So like being able to say, hey, the industry kind of standard, like the companies around us, our competitors, they look like X, or at least we think they do. Um, right. The, the sort of the normal industry average is here. We're, we're down here. Here are the things that we need to be able to do to get there. Yeah. Um, that's that's one. Um, I mentioned data. So I think if you've got processes, if you can put processes in place that will allow you to measure the workload of the team. And be able to vo- verbalize to the executive team and to the board what what you're not able to do or what risks exist because you don't have people on the team. I think that's really critical. And then the other thing I would say is, is if you can get access to to some way to quantify risk, you know, I think there there are a number of ways to do that. Uh, but as much as you can put that risk into dollar terms for the executive team, um, you know, the the investments start to make sense to them, right? It is yeah. likely that this is going to cost us, you know, four hundred thousand dollars, you know, over the next year. If we bring somebody else in for less than that, um, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be a worthwhile investment if it helps us mitigate that risk. Yeah, I, I think uh, the word I always use is a defensible approach. You know, mm-hmm. uh, one is like you don't want to be way less mature than the industry because then if something happens, that's not very defensible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And at the same time, if you want to be a good fiduciary, it's like as a security leader, your job is to translate that into dollars and cents. Like, does it truly make sense for the business or do I need to hold off here? Yep. And it sounds like that was um, very intuitive to you. Uh, do you remember, uh, were you using like fair model or anything just out of curiosity? How did you uh, come up with like the quantification stuff? We, we've not implemented fair. We, we use a tool that actually has insurance data from uh, AIG and other insurers to, to kind of say, hey, this is uh, not having this control in place based on you know, all the, the controls that you do have in place in other places and the, the value proposition that you have and the, the kinds of systems that you run, um, you know, the the, quant- the quantitative sort of value based on historical data from the insurance providers is X, right? And it's directional. It's not going to be perfect, but it gives us a, a number to work with. Um, and so that's been, that's been a huge help. Um, Interesting. A more recent invention for us. Was that, is that, has that been pretty meaningful to like your CFO, CEO, like being able to put dollars and cents to it? Yeah, like I said, it's it's a fairly new process for us, but but yeah, I mean it's it's so hard to quantify risk without something like that. Yeah, uh, you know, being being able to to say, hey, you know, yes, we have the maturity framework over here that we're we're working off of, but also uh, there there may be a little bit more urgency in this one area, and here's how we're going to demonstrate that. Um, I do think I do think it moves the needle for them a lot a lot more. Yeah. The, uh, you I know, think the security industry, just generally speaking, has a long way to go. Like every, almost every CISO I talk to, like the, the thing we all want is like really good quantification data, Yeah, you know, because yeah. uh, 
historically it's kind of seemed like rough estimates maybe they're directionally accurate but not perfectly accurate right but i feel like we're moving closer and closer to a world where they're fairly realistic like they're not yeah. fear uncertainty and doubt numbers where you feel like right. you're not even being authentic about it so i'm excited to see where the industry goes I, I do think i think you're right i think we're headed in the right direction i do think it gets tricky when you apply a blanket number yeah a control or a gap yeah to an environment that could look completely different from most other environments. Exactly. Yeah. There's so much like nuance and context to your individual business that those right. numbers get get funky if you don't take that into consideration. I guess that's where like as a security leader, you have to apply your own judgment a little bit, you know, and like level set that. Yep. Um, so interesting. Yep. Um, moving on from kind of the journey, um, mm -hmm. I want to talk about you reporting in. To me, one of the most fascinating things is... You know, I work with hundreds of CISOs. Mm -hmm. I think I can count on one hand how many of them are a member of the executive leadership team and how many of them report into the CEO. Yeah. So when you and I were talking and you were telling me about that relationship, I was like, man, that's fascinating because that's really difficult to earn. And even more difficult than earning it is like keeping it because you have to demonstrate continuous value so that your CEO right. gives you your time. But you've been able to do that. So can yeah. you talk a little bit about like your reporting structure, membership of the ELT, how you got it, what y'all talk about, that kind of thing? Yeah. So I think, you know, like as far as earning a spot, you know, I think part of it is we have a leadership team and a CEO who just get it right. Um, they are curious in all the right ways about cybersecurity and privacy. Um, I, I also think we've built as a department, a really good reputation throughout the company uh, and with our customers, right. About not only our security program, but sort of our enterprise readiness as a business. Right. And that includes our, our platform. Right. We, we are building things into the platform that don't just serve sellers. They serve the legal team and the security team and the IT team as well. Um, and so I think, you know, that's that's an important part of our our differentiation in the market. Um, and then, you know, I think I think also just, uh, you know, the fact that our customers care so much about cybersecurity, it's important that we've got somebody advocating for them at that executive level. Um, and so, so I guess as far as earning a spot, I think we all just agreed that this makes sense. Um, and, and, and again, I, I kind of go back to the, the reputation that the team, uh, the security team at sales loft has built over the years. I think it's a yeah. really, really good one. How, how often do you guys meet as a leadership team? Uh, we meet, uh, every day we have stand up. Wow. Well, okay. Then, yeah, okay. Stand you know, up. We, yeah. we do, we do our stand up, right? So that's, uh, that's, that's at least 15 minutes of FaceTime that we get. Um, and then we have a weekly ops meeting. And so the, the goal of that ops meeting is uh, to do functional reviews. So we go around the room. Uh, every we, we also talk about, you know, personal, professional uh, highlights or wins, you know, things that are going on in our lives. Um, and then we also talk about, like I said, our, our functional reviews. Like what's what are the things that are going on uh, in each of our teams? Uh, we try to be as consistent as possible with the metrics that we review in those discussions as well. Uh, we obviously talk about forecast and, and numbers, right? Um, and then there's usually a handful of kind of special topics that come up each week. Are there a handful of like things that you share regularly that the business finds important, like uh, related to security? Um, I try to, I try to give uh, sort of three things that ELT should know, right? Yeah. Cause you know, if, if I get too deep into, into vulnerability management or threat detection stats or compliance, it, it can get a little bit heavy for that discussion. So I really try to bubble it up into to sort of three distinct areas um, or three three distinct bullet points. That's These are the three things you need to know this week. Uh, but then, uh, you know, I'll often talk about um, compliance, right? What are the uh, what are the milestones that we're achieving? We just went through ISO 27701. Um, so I gave the team an update on, on what that is, what it means, how it impacts our customers. Um, but then, you know, we do, we do, you know, our chief product officer is in that, in that room. So I will bring up, you know, Hey, um, you know, this is, this is what we look like from an AppSec perspective this week. Here are the major themes that we're seeing, but again, try to keep it, uh, to the point I made earlier, try to keep it fairly high level so that yeah. eyes are not glazing over and you're losing kind of credibility and trust with that team. How much of your, um, up. So this is one thing that I see the higher you move up into the organization, um, especially at the ELT uh, level is like, you obviously have your domain of specialty, which is IT and security mm -hmm. for you, but you have to have like a, a broader business acumen and you're probably right. contributing and asking probing questions when other people are providing updates. Yeah. So like what percentage of the time do you think you're talking about 
security and IT versus what percentage of the time do you think you're thinking about broader business issues? Yeah, I think that's the balance, right? Is is I think there's a lot of listening you do as a CISO in those in those discussions, um, but I think there's there's a balance of you know one ensuring that the business is thinking about risk when it needs to be, right? If we're talking about a, a rollout of a new product capability and there is a, a privacy gap in our plan or a security gap in our plan, they're going to hear from me about it in that setting. Uh, and at the same time, if we're talking about something completely different that has nothing to do with with cybersecurity, right? Maybe it's a, a big deal on the, the revenue side um, uh, or customer retention or something like that. Um, I, I do think there is a level of uh, competence that CISOs need to have um, and, and a level of contribution that you need to be any member of the ELT um, needs to be doing. Because I think there's, there's a, a saying that we have in the room, which is, look, if, you know, if somebody's talking and you've got a question, there's a good chance at least one other person in the room has that same question, and so we're not going to be afraid to to raise our hands and voice those questions. They're you know they're not stupid questions. Yeah. Um, and so um, you know I, I do think it's important for for CISOs to feel like they have a voice in that room, even on topics that are not related to security or privacy. And w- one of the reasons there, by the way, is like as a CISO, you've got to understand where the business is headed. And so if you, if you are just, if your eyes are glazing over and you're not following what's going on in those discussions, like you're going to fall behind and, and you're going to miss things. And so I think, I think there's um, that that's super important. And, and the last thing I'll say is, you know, we've got an ELT and I, I would encourage others to do this. That is really open to being pulled aside and said, Hey, I heard you talking about X, you know, can you, can you tell me more about that? Can I spend 15 minutes with you to just, you know, understand more about what you're, uh, what you're doing? Yeah. Uh, one thing that I see um, I wrote the whole book security team operating system on it. And in fact, is like one of the biggest disconnects uh, between security and the business is that as security leaders, it is easy to fall in the trap of just getting too wrapped around the axle on security program, mm-hmm. which is good, but you start losing sight of like what the business's priorities are, uh, mm-hmm. because maybe they're going to do M and a, maybe the next round of funding, maybe there's diligence coming, maybe there's a new product release, like you mentioned, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. And, um, but the closer you can get to tying your security program objectives to the overarching business objectives, mm-hmm. the, the more harmony there's going to be and the better you can support the business. And you've done that very well, I think naturally, mm-hmm. what do you think prepared you like what, where did that intuition come from? Cause you have a strong business acumen. You're able to contribute to the ELT, mm-hmm. put security in context of the business. Is there anything that you can point to that, that helped develop that skill set, or was it just natural? I think time is on my side. I've been here for over seven years, over yeah. seven, over seven years. You tend to learn some things. Um, one axiom that our, our founder, Kyle Porter used to say all the time was, uh, learn faster than the rate of your own experience. And so I think that's one, that's important inside the business. I think, you know, that that act of going to somebody and say, hey, I know you're working on X. I don't know what that is, but I want to learn more about it, even if it has nothing to do with cybersecurity, right? Being invested in where the company is going and those big initiatives that the company's undertaking, I think is is something that CISO should be should absolutely be doing. I also think it's something that CISO should be doing with their network, right? Uh, that's that's probably been from a uh, technical standpoint. That's been one of the harder things for me to mm-hmm. get out of my comfort zone and go. You know, I I'm connected to this uh, security leader over at this company. Um, it seems like they're maybe in a similar growth stage as us, or maybe they're a little bit ahead of us. I'd love to you know pick their brain. Um, and it takes some some doing to get out of that comfort zone to go, you know, um, to to you know meet someone and you know and have a conversation. Uh, but I would encourage folks to to do that both internally with, you know, business leaders, but then also externally with other security leaders. Yes, yeah, it was a great tip. Uh, the, it's funny you mentioned this. I, I didn't think about this until you mentioned it, but just the power of tenure, the power of being somewhere for a while. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've been at, I've started Risk360 and been here almost 10 years. So like all of that tenure comes with historical context and just understanding and you're learning fast and, and you've kind of had the same journey with SalesLoft, just accumulate all that knowledge. But I think the average tenure of uh, a security executive is like 18 months. And I've seen this yeah, in the consulting yeah. role too. You get a new CISO and like, mm-hmm. I mean, you just can't really get attached to the business right. in less than a year. It just takes time. Yeah. What What do you talk your tenure up to? Like uh, what's, what's given you the staying power to be able to stay at the organization for so long? 
staying power. Yeah, I think I think it's uh, sort of a sense of um, of unfinished business in in a way. Like, uh, and, and maybe I'm just built this way, and then I'll always think about it this way. But I I want to see this program through, um, and, and I I want to be, you know, I have I have wanted to 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 get the program to a level of maturity that walking away from it, I could feel like if, if I walk away from it, that I could feel like, Hey, this is, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of this. And I, there, there, don't get me wrong. There are so many things that we've done that I'm very proud of. Um, but there is kind of this, this sense of we can do more, right. And, and we can be sharper, we can be better. Um, and so I think that's part of it. And that's, that may just be a personal thing. Um, but two, I think it's the business. I think it's like, it's where we're headed, right. As yeah. a company. Um, there's so much to be excited about. Um, and, and, you know, this is true. I think of our entire team, like we want to be here for it. Right. And so, um, you know, I think the combination of those two things has, has led to me being here for a long time. And you, you, you called it, you know, you, you called it, I think I referred to myself in a meeting the other day as father time at sales love, because I, there are just things that come up where I'm like, ah, there's literally no way you would have known the answer to this, but here's who you need to go talk to, right? Yeah, um, it's the secret sauce. And <laughs> for those of you who aren't f- that familiar with Sales Loft too, they're an Atlanta company. Uh, I'm in Atlanta, Mike's in Atlanta. So we're very familiar, like here in Atlanta, uh, Sales Loft is known to have a great culture, a great founder, great current uh, CEO. So mm-hmm. I think there's just something to be said about being particular about which company you join, which you you chose well, you had some exposure to Sales Loft and yeah. Um, I think so often uh, as an executive or just a security leader, you can get pulled into a company because of a huge salary, which is not a bad thing. That's an okay thing, but maybe that's not the greatest reason to choose a job. Uh, And then also um, maybe you just want that next role. Like you just want the big, big hairy problem to solve. And it's the big company. And then you get in there and you're like, oh, this is a company who doesn't care about security the way they said they did. They have so much dysfunction or they're not healthy. But everything I've ever heard you say is like, even you said it earlier, security team is intuitively understanding why security is important. You're a member of the executive leadership team. So that's them putting their money where their mouth is. Mm -hmm. It's probably, I'm just now analyzing this in real time. It's like a good combination of your own desire to see something through in a great culture and you doing a good job choosing a good company. So just stuff for people to think about as they're thinking about their own career. Let's talk about, there's already some questions coming through actually about uh, SOC 2 and ISO 27001 of all things. So, uh, so you, you at uh, sales law to help um, build the SOC 2 program, maintain the SOC 2 program, get ISO 27001, which is security. And then recently 27701, which is privacy. You guys also have a whole privacy universe because you're, uh, as a sales platform, that of course is uh, is really important. Can you talk to me about? Um, let's let's start with like why why are those frameworks so important to the business? And then maybe mm-hmm. start from the beginning. Like, what was your process um, to to onboard those to do the mm-hmm. initial gap assessment, kind of your roadmap? But before yeah. you do that, I do want to. Uh, I, I stole a screenshot because I was so impressed. Uh, I hadn't somehow, even though we've been working together so long, I had never looked at this. So I'm going to share it with everybody. I have no just, idea what you're about to put up. <laughs> <laughs> it's just y'all's uh, portal, like your trust center. Oh, cool. I nice. thought that was so so well done. I've seen these trust center uh, portals together, but open to the public. But uh, yeah. just the level level of transparency that you guys put out there uh, to mm-hmm. let people do due do, do diligence on your platform, all the different things that you guys are compliant with. So if y'all want to see a, a really good example of a, a trust center uh, out there, I think Sales Loft d- does a wonderful job with with transparency out there. So, uh, but Mike, yeah, talk mm-hmm. us through talk us through the journey. Really, really quick on that note with with the trust portal. One of the things that I thought about after you uh, after we moved away from it was sort of like. Uh, if somebody's looking to earn a spot on the executive team, yeah. one of the things that they can do, especially in like a SaaS business where your customers have lots of questions about your security program is have the mindset of building customer trust, right? You can't bend over backwards for every single customer and answer, you know, a 500 question questionnaire for a customer that pays you $5. But, you know, there are ways for you to go above and beyond to serve your customers, uh, to make sure the marketing team has what they need in, in terms of, you know, the, the ability to talk about the security program externally, uh, to enable your sellers, enable the, the customer success folks to be able to be competent, um, you know, in those conversations with customers. And so that's the other thing I would say is like, yeah. know, know when to, to like lean into, you know, using security as a, as a marketing tool and as a revenue generator. 
Um, don't don't allow yourself to just be seen as a cost center. Yeah. Uh, so how, how, how much time do you think, Mike, you spend with uh, like educating your sales team or contributing to sales calls or answering mm-hmm. security questionnaires? That's, especially early on, that's like vital revenue support right. functions. How yeah. much time do you think you, you spend doing that? Early on, it was a lot because early on, we didn't have materials. We didn't have a trust portal. We had like a single page on the website, um, you know, that was, uh, uh, I don't know. It was, it was basic, right? It was just a a handful of blurbs about the different types of controls that we have in place. Um, And then customers had questions for us and we would answer any question that that a customer had. We'd we'd answer any questionnaire. There was no, um, you know, consideration on our side of, you know, is this, um, does, is the work commensurate with the amount of revenue? We were just doing whatever we could to, to get customers in the door. And so, um, so that's very different from how it looks today because what we've done over time is try to build out more scalable, processes. So we've got a trust portal. We do enablement with uh, the revenue organization once a quarter or so. Um, We've got our sales engineers trained up on uh, many of the the security questions that our customers have. And then we've also got a a team, a GRC team that's, you know, helping to to address those customer concerns. So, um, you know, I'd say how at this point, the amount of time I spend on cybersecurity for like, you know, answering questions for customers is less than when we first started, but it's much more strategic. Yeah. So, hey, we're, you know, we've got a CISO at a large enterprise who's got questions, you know, can we get you on a call with them? That's great. That's the stuff I'm, I, I kind of live for. Uh, yeah. My- that's, that's the good stuff, man. Talk, yeah. uh, while we're on it, there's one thing that comes up a lot. Mm-hmm. And um, I talk to security programs a lot and they're caught up in the cycle of uh, just endless security questionnaires. And they haven't been able to mature their self out of it where mm-hmm. like they take into consideration how much revenue is on the line right. or back a little bit and say, hey, look, we've already answered this. Use our mm-hmm. standard questionnaire. And then one thing I'll often say is, hey, stand up at a trust center like you guys have done mm-hmm. and uh, educate this sales because I, I can promise you the sales engineer want to have to wait to go ask you. Right. They want to uh, self-serve. So can you, you mentioned that y'all do like quarterly enablement with your sales team, probably did some stuff before, but what's their reaction to that? This on yeah. the ground lines, do they, they appreciate being able to self-serve or, or how did that I, go? I think they do. I think they recognize that one, the security team's primary role is to think about and address risk, not to answer customer questions, though. Absolutely. That is a part of the job. And so I think they, they get it and they get that it's a fairly small team. Um, so they get that it's, you know, the security team is not just this in, you know, uh, infinite resource. Um, but they also want to be able to address customer concerns about security. And so they, they need a process to be able to follow. And that's why we do that enablement, right? Is we want to make sure that folks know early, early on, we've got a great story to tell about security. Don't hide from it. And I would say to any, any company out there, if you feel like you're hiding, you know, something about security from your customers, or you feel like you kind of want to skirt around the security process, like there's work you need to do internally so that you don't yeah. feel that way. So you can embrace that conversation because in the enterprise software world, like it's, it's coming, right. That, that conversation is not going to, um, is not just going to magically not happen. And so, um, you know, what, that's the, that's probably the biggest thing that we've coached our sales team on is embrace that conversation as early as possible. Even if you're not talking to a security audience, go ahead and get them the trust portal as just a primer. Um, and then if they have deeper questions, they can come back. And so I think, you know, the, the team has been receptive to it. We're not perfect at it, but I think the team has been really receptive to kind of the, the, the process that we've run with the trust portal. And, and the other thing that we do, by the way, is we establish uh, SLAs for, you know, um, with our internal SLAs, with our sales team to say, hey, based on all the information about this deal that we can see, the expected turnaround time for this is five business days. So they're not left wondering, you know, when am I going to hear back from the security team? Yeah. Sense. Mike, talk us through, um, we talked a little about, we alluded to earlier, just the SOC 2 and the ISO 27001 journey. Um, mm-hmm. Talk us through that. Why did you guys choose to do both instead of just either SOC 2 or ISO? Yeah, so I think uh, they serve different purposes, right? And SOC 2 actually predated me. They, the sales office had gone through SOC 2 type 1 with me on the other side of the desk because the auditor yeah. so an interesting um, switch there. So um, we went through, when I joined, we went through SOC 2 type 2. And then quickly after that, ISO 27001. And ISO was really kind of the first thing that I, I got into and did as a, as a security leader at SalesLoft. There was some urgency around it because customers were asking for it, right? They wanted to see that, 
you know, Salesloft not only had a, a full report that they could dig into and understand, you know, auditors' opinions on uh, on their controls over a 12-month period, they also wanted to see that there was a clear framework or system in place uh, that, you know, kind of would would ultimately be scalable and and it's turned out to be seven years later. So I think the the reason that we decided to do both is twofold. It's customers were asking for it. And so you just kind of do what customers want you to do, especially in those early, early days. But also we knew that this was going to set, kind of lay the groundwork for the future of the program. And so we still say today our, our program is built on ISO 27001. Yeah, that's awesome. Talk to me a little bit about like how you've operationalized it. Like uh, I hear from the governance perspective, you do your risk council meeting. How do you do tactical things like making sure controls are operational, gathering audit evidence, stuff right. like that? Yeah, yeah. So our goal has always been for compliance not to be a checkbox exercise, right? We we don't believe that uh, you know it, it makes a whole lot of sense for us to spend a bunch of energy to get compliant with a framework or a standard or regulation. Um, you know, but it doesn't really add any value to the business. So we try to make sure that the the things that we're doing to be compliant are also adding value from a risk perspective. I think a lot of companies, and it's, it's not easy to do. Sometimes the frameworks don't make perfect sense with your business, or maybe a control requirement takes a, a you know a certain degree of interpretation to get right. Um, so I think there's some um, that that is a challenge for a lot of security teams. Um, you know, I I think we also have have really strived to like make things scalable. So where possible, automate. Um, a good example of that is is uh, our PAM solution and our the process for getting access to production resources used to be this heavy like manual ticket approval process that required like three different people to you know to get into a ticket and then we'd have to pass it from one system to another. We kind of totally did away with that. Our IAM team was able to fully automate a, a workflow that allowed people to get access when they need it. Um, you know, through a, through a PAM solution. And so um, it's, and still be in, in compliance, right? But it saved us a ton of time. So we really try to focus like the controls that we create. We try to try to make sure that those are as scalable and automated as possible. Uh, ultimately uh, in a way too, that, that allows us to, to gather audit evidence when we need it at the end of the period. Awesome. Yeah. We have um, a couple of questions coming in. Maybe we can address right. those now. People are really, uh, they're asking a lot of questions about getting the, the program off the ground. Like what's the first step you did, like a gap assessment and putting a roadmap together. Yeah. I will say for everybody asking that question, or if you're watching this on YouTube later, we're going to put a link uh, in this webinar and we'll share it now with uh, our, our basically readiness checklist. There's a template where you can go through and do a whole readiness process. So we'll, we'll uh, provide that as a resource. But Mike, what did y'all do? Like say ISO or SOC 2, just getting it off the ground. What's the first take? Yeah, ISO was literally looking at the standard, looking at the control environment that we have and identifying where do we have controls in place that align to the ISO requirement and where do we not? And literally documenting that in a spreadsheet at the time. Yeah. Uh, and so, I mean, it, it sounds basic, but man, when you don't have a system in place, like a, you know, a, a GRC system or something like that, spreadsheets are fine, right? And so... Um, that was actually a really, for me, it was a really eye-opening exercise. And it was great because it allowed me to talk to so many people in the business to say, hey, look, we've got this big audit coming up. It's going to be meaningful for our customers. We all care about growth here, right? This is one of the things that's going to help us scale uh, as a business. And so I need, I need your help in answering whether we have a control in place for this. So it was a good way to just get to know how people were operating, get to know who kind of the key people were throughout the business. Um, but that was it, man. It was it was really just a a set of requirements from ISO and what does Salesloft do? What's the evidence uh, that you know Salesloft is meeting those requirements? And where there are gaps, actually go put those controls in place. Work with the stakeholders, you know, around yeah. the business. So you did your own internal gap assessment, Correct. basically. What about building the roadmap? Like after you did the initial gap assessment, you uncovered like let's, uh, you uncovered some things that needed to do. Yeah. Was that was that stuff that you could handle yourself or did you have to kind of report that larger roadmap to the leadership team to get buy in? Yeah, I think at the time back back in the early days, the roadmap was um, was really more of a, a conversation. I reported to to the president of the company at the time or chief chief operating officer might have been his title. He, was, he had a bunch of titles while he was here. He's one of our co-founders, Rob. Um, and, you know, that discussion back then was. Hey, these are the things I think we need to do in the next six, 12, 18 months. 
um, you know, what do you think? And I'll never forget the first conversation I had with him like that. We, we took a walk around in the old sales loft office over near ATV or Atlanta Tech Village. We took a walk around the block over there in Buckhead. And I, the whole time, I'm just reading off all the things that I think we need to do. Uh, this is like the roadmap, right? And he's like, we get back and like, I've talked for the entire time. I was like, so what do you think? He's like, yeah, I think you should go do it. <laughs> it was very like, uh, very much an enabler, very much a like, hey, this is, if, if you, we, we hired you because we think you're the right guy for the job and we want you to help guide us here. This is, you know, if this is what you want the roadmap to look like, let me know what you need. But yes, by all means, go and go forth and conquer, which was, which was great for me to hear. Um, that, of course, required a level of investment that then took, you know, some, um, you know, some conversations about, about, you know, kind of going back to quantifying risk and, and building the business case. Um, but I, you know, I think building, building out a road, showing that you have a roadmap, showing that you have a set of gaps that you think need to be addressed, I think is a, a really good first step to just starting that conversation. Good stuff. Let me share something with everyone. Cause there's a lot of questions coming through. Uh, we do have this, uh, the CISO toolkit that we'll share is kind of a 90 day CISO uh, tool toolkit. And one of the things that is, is in there is the Excel spreadsheet Mike was talking about. We have created one just like that. That's based on ISO. And we took the ISO framework, made it in, into questions instead of controls. And you can go through and do your own gap assessment. And then there's a dashboard tab that will generate a kind of a maturity dashboard. So if you want to try to present that to leadership or get a sense for where you are. So everybody out there asking questions about like the checklist piece of it, just uh, look for that link and uh, you can download that. And that's a lot like what Mike just described. Uh, Mike, talk to me about um, another question that's coming through is um, as you build out. So in SOC 2, we've also had this world of uh, privacy regulations, especially like GDPR, CPRA. And you guys have done 27701, which is ISO's answer to privacy. Right. How, how have you thought about um adding privacy onto your, either your responsibilities or partnering internally with someone on privacy? How, how has privacy impacted you guys? Yeah, I think GDPR really kind of necessitated uh, some action on our side, right? Customers were asking about it way back in 2017 and they wanted to know, you know, what is SalesLoft doing both in the platform and then also from a policy and process perspective, how is SalesLoft going to be able to support us? And so uh, security at SalesLoft kind of owned privacy from the beginning, um, you know, almost out of just necessity because there's nobody else to do it. But I think it makes sense, right? A lot yeah. of, while security and privacy are different concepts, they're different things, they're different disciplines, there's so much overlap, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, privacy requirements that, you know, uh, require security controls to be in place. Um, so I think um, we have partnered really, really closely with our, our legal team. So we've got, we're, we're talking to, to our legal team constantly about you know privacy initiatives, making sure our policies and our agreements with customers and vendors are are all you know buttoned up to align with privacy regulations, um, and so you know I, I think uh, ISO twenty seven seven zero one was sort of like hey we want to be able to demonstrate to our customers that we do all these things, let's go let's go make sure that we you know one that our processes do align to this global best practice, and then two let's let's go ahead and get certified in it so that we can you know we can brag about it in the market. That's awesome. We have about five minutes left. And I want to leave some time just to talk tactics, like favorite tool sets, like brass tacks, things people can go do. Um, the first one is, can you run us through just real quick, like your meeting cadences? I think that's very like opening up your calendar to people. Mm -hmm. uh, you already yep. mentioned that you do daily standups, one on ones. Mm -hmm. uh, like what's your weekly, daily, monthly kind of calendar look like in terms of communication with your team? Yeah, so communication with the team. You, you talked about standups, uh, one on ones. Every everybody in the company or every everybody in the department at least has a, a weekly or bi weekly one on one with their manager. Um, I also try to do quarterly skip levels. So uh, you know, one one level down on the org chart, just making sure that we've got a good kind of uh, feedback loop for how managers are doing and how how individual contributors on the team are doing. Um, we have a weekly leadership meeting with my team, so that's to review. Uh, in addition to cyber, I also own IT. So uh, from an IT, GRC, cybersecurity, and project management perspective, are we making the expected uh, progress on things? Are there blockers? Are there trends we're seeing that need to be addressed? Um, our, our SecOps team runs a patching and vulnerability group, which has been tremendously successful. That's where we take, you know, by kind of scope or domain, we'll have an engineering 
patching and vulnerability group. We have an IT patching and vulnerability group. We have an infrastructure patching and vulnerability group. Um, and so the goal there is to make sure that we've got a regular cadence to talk through processes and ensure that we are, you know, meaningfully, um, that we're patching in the right places and that we're, you know, uh, we're staying in line with our SLAs and that our processes make sense. That's awesome. Um, and then the, the last one I'll say is I think cyber risk management is, is we've talked a little bit about this. I think this is maybe the most underrated aspect of the job of being a CISO is the ability to influence roadmap when you don't have a mandate. So how do you, how do you, you know, the engineering team doesn't report to you. How do you ensure that they're thinking about risk the right way and they're prioritizing the right things? Um, obviously they're, they're worried about shipping great product. They also have to be worried about ensuring that that product is secure. And so, you know, how do you, how do you influence that group? It's, it's at the end of the day, it's sales, right? How do you influence yeah. that group and their, their, uh, you know, prioritization? Um, and that, so we do that on a monthly basis as well with each of the kind of stakeholder groups. Awesome. Um, and then from the macro perspective, you know, we, we, we borrow a lot of the concepts from your, your operating system, uh, which by the way, shameless plug, it's a great book. And I think it's applicable beyond just the security, uh, realm. Um, but you know, annual planning, um, we, we start that process right about now for a February one, uh, uh, year, uh, beginning of the year. Uh, we do an annual kickoff at the beginning of February. We have a monthly team all hands for all of corporate technology. Um, and then we also have quarterly performance uh, conversations for everybody in the company. Um, and so, you know, uh, that's probably not everything, but hopefully that gives folks an idea of uh, what, what my calendar looks like in a given month. Awesome. Yeah, I'm going to show people too uh, the book, Security Team Operating System. There's chapter five in here where we cover off on like just standard rhythms. Mm -hmm. uh, monthly, annual, quarterly, daily. So if y'all are just looking for some inspiration, take it from Mike. And, and there's also some great templates in the books that you can use too. What about um, with our last couple of minutes? What about just like best bang for your buck tools? So there, is there anything that you would endorse that you just kind of use, even if it's like just personal productivity, uh, any type of tool or so even name the tool name if you want uh, that has been really needle moving for you guys? Yeah, I think, you know, I, it's, it's an interesting question. I think, you know, we, we have a pretty standard tool set for a, a SaaS business in terms of like communication, right? We were big Slack users. Uh, we use Atlassian products for uh, planning and documentation, uh, Jira and Confluence respectfully or yeah. respectively. Um, you know, as, as far as tools that I would endorse, I think there's, there's a couple that like, it's pretty rare that you use a piece of software and you're like, man, this was awesome. Um, I think Okta is just a great piece of software. It yeah. just is, um, and for, for, you know, in the age of like identity-based attacks being kind of the, the, the biggest emerging threat, um, you know, I think it's important that you find an identity, identity provider that, that you like. I'm uh, going to clip this and send it to Okta. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I was like, uh, well, maybe, maybe not. We need to like negotiate a, a contract here in a little bit, but, uh, but anyway, no, Okta's great. We, we love it. Um, and then, you know, I also think we, we've been really impressed with what Sneak is doing in the AppSec space. Um, you know, they, they've, they do everything from, um, dependency vulnerabilities to infrastructure as code issues, uh, container base image scanning, and then also like static analysis, like traditional AppSec, uh, you know, scanning. So, um, super impressed with them. And then, you know, I think as a tool, I, I actually think like maturity frameworks, I've, I've referenced them a couple of times, but whether it's like NIST CSF or, you know, pick your framework, I, NIST CSF is the one that we use and we, we really like. Um, those are just really useful to kind of just gauge at a very high level. It doesn't have to be super scientific at a very high level. Like what kind of progress are you making in your, your maturity journey? Well, Mike, man, appreciate you being so transparent and like sharing your story here. Uh, like this is an awesome journey. If you guys want to connect with Mike, you can go to LinkedIn, look up Mike Meyer. He, he's on there. Uh, highly suggest checking out sales loft and Mike and, and their journey. If you want any of these tools, uh, we will share them, especially the maturity assessment. Uh, we'll share the link down in this video. We also have a GRC platform that if you want to get out of Excel and do it in a platform, we have a platform called Full Circle. That's our GRC platform that you can check out. And uh, Mike, again, we appreciate your time. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. This was great. Thanks. Take care.